It was the turning point of the turning point. The tiny pivot that perhaps allowed history to swing on its axis, ushering in the future. At 3 p.m. on July the 3rd, 1863, a line of 12,500 Confederate troops descended on Seminary Ridge outside the town of Gettysburg. Ahead of them lay nearly a mile of open terrain. Beyond that, a small hill and a low stone wall, behind which waited some 6,000 Union soldiers. The plan was simple. The Southerners would hit the Union at their point of maximum weakness, overwhelming their understaffed lines. Victory would mean not just victory in the Battle of Gettysburg, but enough glory to ensure their names went down in history. But while Robert E. Lee's men would certainly go down in history that day, it would be for the wrong reasons. Because the assault, known as Pickett's Charge, was destined to end not in victory, but in one of the worst defeats suffered in the entire Civil War. Today, Warographics is digging in not to a conflict or even a battle, but rather a single military action, a single action on a single day that, nonetheless, changed the course of American history. As the sun set on July the 2nd, 1863, it was on a United States witnessing unprecedented carnage. Now, at the end of its second day, the Battle of Gettysburg had been raging for nearly 48 hours. 48 hours in which gruesome records of death and injury had been set, in which some 165,000 troops had engaged in one of the largest fights to ever take place on U.S. soil. And as the hot, humid July day drew to a close, things were still far from over. In the gathering dusk, an observer on a distant hill might have just been able to make out the position of the two armies. To the south of the small Pennsylvania town, the Union Army of the Potomac under General George G. Meade had retreated to a set of low ridges and hills. One of these, Cemetery Ridge, lay directly across from one of General Robert E. Lee's Confederate encampments on the near homophone Seminary Ridge. Between the two stretched not quite a mile of farmland, studded with fences and stone walls. The hypothetical observer would have no way of knowing it, but it would be this stretch of farmland that would soon play host to the most brutal fighting of all. That evening, though, everything was quiet, or at least as quiet as things can be when you have over 150,000 adrenaline-filled men moving around in a confined space. In the two opposing camps, though, fierce debates were raging about what to do next. On the Confederate side, many of Lee's officers were urging a retreat. They'd march north to secure supplies and take the fight to the Union, they argued. Now that was done, why not draw back and preserve their strength? But Lee wasn't convinced. After two days of battle, which seemed to favor his army, he felt victory must be at hand, that the Northerners must have a weak spot in their line somewhere. A weak spot that he could exploit using some of the fresh troops who had arrived that afternoon. 4,500 Virginians had specifically held back under their commander, Major General George Pickett. And yeah, as you probably guessed, that's the same George Pickett who'd soon lend his name to the ill-fated charge. The plan that Lee developed that night was remarkably simple. Over July the 2nd, his men had repeatedly hit the Union flanks only to find them stronger than expected. Reasoning, therefore, that the center must be the weak point, Lee envisaged a diversionary attack at a flashpoint known as Culp's Hill that would make the Army of the Potomac quickly shift troops there, followed by a massive charge at the weakened center. All going well, they'd break through, split the Union lines into and be having tea in Pittsburgh before Meade knew what hit him. Yet Lee wasn't the only one making plans. Across the dark farmland, General Meade was holding a war council of his own. Unlike the popular image of him as a bit of a buffoon, the real Meade was a guy trying his best in extremely trying circumstances. Freshly promoted, he'd barely taken over the Army of the Potomac when the Battle of Gettysburg erupted, throwing him headlong into a baptism of fire that also threatened to double as his funeral. Despite that, and some resentment among his men, he was already proving adept at moving troops into position for reinforcing the lines and at divining what his opponent might do next. And that night, he divined that Lee was going to strike his center. Of course, this was still Robert E. Lee we're talking about, the sort of military talent who could deal with you figuring out his plan and still pull off a great victory. Luckily for Meade, though, by the second evening of Gettysburg, Lee was getting sloppy. Unlike his Union counterpart, Lee held no great council of war. He gave no hyper-detailed instructions, instead sending out orders that outlined goals and targets rather than a concrete plan. The resulting coordination issues would give Meade an unexpected edge. Not much of one, but perhaps enough to secure victory. Enough, too, to ensure that George Pickett's men would go charging not into glory, but into their graves.
The phrase has it that hindsight is 2020. With the benefit of that perfect vision, we in the present can clearly see what those at the Battle of Gettysburg couldn't. That these men started July the 3rd bedeviled by problems. The general himself had woken at 3 a.m. to eat a simple breakfast under the stars. Then, fed, he had mounted his gray horse and ridden out into the equally gray light of dawn to make preparations. The first hint oh, we can see of the looming disaster came in his meeting with Lieutenant General James Longstreet. Stationed on Seminary Ridge, Longstreet would be instrumental in Lee's plan. The guy who'd direct the artillery designed to soften up enemy lines before giving the order to charge. But while Longstreet was loyal, he was less than enthusiastic about Lee these orders, trying to talk the general out of it even at this late stage. It was while the two were on the ridge that the next warning sign came. At 8 a.m., light flared at Culp's Hill. The diversionary attack on the flanks that Lee had ordered was beginning. Yet the rest of his men weren't even remotely ready to charge the center. The artillery bombardment wouldn't even begin for hours. That meant Meade wouldn't find himself simultaneously trying to hold two parts of the line, meaning reinforcements would be free to move around. This is where the whole lack of coordination thing starts to damage Lee's chances, especially given the unsustainable losses the Confederacy was suffering at Culp's Hill. But remember, we're looking at this with our eerily perfect future vision. At the time, Lee thought he could still make out the faint outlines of victory, her arms spread wide above the battlefield, and he thought he had the perfect tools to win her favor. As the morning passed and the fighting at Culp's Hill intensified, the Union soldiers at Cemetery Ridge observed an awful sight. Artillery guns were being rolled into position on the Confederate side, gun after gun shifting to concentrate all of its firepower on the northern lines. The Union troops had gun batteries on their side too, 75 of them capable of hitting Seminary Ridge. But Lee laughed in the face of such a small number. By 1 p.m., his forces had marshaled 150 artillery pieces. At exactly 1.07 p.m. on July the 3rd, the order went out. A single shell fired in a puff of smoke. The signal for the Confederate batteries to open. And so began not just the heaviest artillery assault of the Civil War, but the heaviest to ever take place on American soil. With 150 guns blasting their positions, the Union troops were caught in a maelstrom of lead and fire. Exploding shells tore trees to matchwood. Shrapnel killed anything not hugging the ground. In the rear, General Meade's headquarters were at one point being hit with six shells a minute. It was like a foretaste of the horrors of World War I, a poisonous appetizer served up by a god who knows what evil artillery will unleash in the future. It was also, however, a stupendous failure. So here's the thing with Confederate artillery. The fuses sucked. Exploding shells would burst not over cowering Union troops hugging the dirt, but rather early if they exploded at all. On top of that, the aiming was off. Rather than pound the northerners' front lines, the cannonade went whizzing overhead, smashing into the rear, where shells caused chaos and killed horses, but otherwise did little to soften the Union troops up. In fact, there's a great anecdote from the battle showing just how ineffective Lee's bombardment was. After initial ducking, Brigadier General Alexander Webb of the Second Corps noticed how off-target the shells were. So, rather than staying low, he got up, strode to the copse of trees the rebels were trying to hit, lit his pipe, and laconically sat there smoking, smiling as shell after shell fell to kill him. He wasn't the only one. The commander on Cemetery Ridge, General Winfield S. Hancock, likewise mounted his horse and rode along the front lines, both a symbol of courage for his men and a very open way of taunting in Lee's general direction. Given this was literally the biggest artillery duel to ever take place in the United States, its results were a dismal failure. A few Union guns were taken out, there were some dead horses, a whole lot of sound and fury signifying, well, what exactly? The tragedy, though, is that the Confederates didn't know this. Over on their side, the rebels were already preparing for a charge. They assumed that the troops facing them would already be severely weakened. It was this one flawed assumption that would turn Pickett's charge into a massacre. Now, before we get into the charge itself, we should probably deal with a common misconception. Despite being called Pickett's Charge, the coming disaster involved way more men than George Pickett commanded. The Virginians under his command made up only slightly over a third of all the troops involved. There were literally thousands of others, 12,500 in all, from states like North Carolina, Alabama, Tennessee, and Mississippi. Nor was George Pickett the only commander. Generals Isaac Trimble and James Johnson Pettigrew would charge right alongside him, as would Brigadier General. General Lewis Armistead. And here's a random fact about Armistead. Prior to the war, he'd been buddies with Winfield S. Hancock, the same Union general who'd be defending against his charge. Civil wars, everybody. Good for drama, awful for 
interpersonal relationships. Given that Pickett wasn't the only leader of the charge, then you might be wondering why it's named after him. The simple answer is that it's all to do with Richmond, Virginia. By 1863, the press operating out of Richmond had become the de facto Confederate press corps, the only ones capable of fielding reporters who could cover all the major battles. So, when a whole bunch of Virginians got killed attacking Cemetery Ridge, the entire South got the version written by fellow Virginians shocked at their deaths. A version that centered on the actions of those from Old Dominion and their commander George Pickett. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. For now, let's return to the Gettysburg front lines as the two-hour cannon duel thunders towards its conclusion. As the Confederacy starts running low on shells and anxious commanders wait for Lieutenant General James Longstreet to order the charge to begin. Believe me, it's an order Longstreet was desperate not to give. As the cannons blasted, the officer was uneasily examining the terrain, the near mile of uneven ground, the fences that would have to be broken up or crossed, the Emmitsburg Road running through the middle. The humidity and heat too, pushing 87 Fahrenheit or 30 Celsius that many of his soldiers had been sweltering in for hours. It didn't take a genius to see how this could all go badly wrong. Still, Lee had made it clear that the attack would go ahead. So, just before 3 p.m., Longstreet ordered the shelling to end. One of his junior officers asked if they should now advance. Unable to vocalize, the lieutenant general just gave a jerky nod. Yet, this was signal enough. Along the line, the cannons fell silent. Behind Seminary Ridge and within a sheltering woodline, thousands of men got to their feet. They marched forward. A line of rebel troops, over a mile from end to end, prepared to meet their fates. They were arranged in compact lines, with more men concentrated to the right-hand flank. As they marched, their plan was to bunch closer, until they created an overwhelming force that would punch right through General Hancock's line. Toward the center, Pickett let out a cry to his own men. Don't forget today that you are from old Virginia. And with that, the charge began. Not that it was a charge in the sense of moving fast. Rather than running and giving the rebel yell, the Confederate soldiers marched ahead at the regulation pace of 100 yards a minute, or surprisingly slow in metric. This was to stop the line from breaking, to ensure that when the order came, all rebels could stop at once and unleash a hail of musket fire without worrying about Bob from Alabama tripping over and dropping his rifle, or Doug from Florida accidentally getting ahead and getting shot in the back. But it had a real psychological effect, too. At the Union line, soldiers watched the advance with terror. One man wrote that the Southerners moved like automatons, a bunch of 19th century terminators, deadly and unstoppable. Others confided in letters that they expected to shortly be in Confederate prison. It's easy to see why. Behind the stone wall, Hancock commanded only 6,000 men. They were outnumbered and outgunned. Yet that fear would soon dissipate. As the charge reached the first wooden fence, the Union guns that had survived the cannonade suddenly roared to life. There was a blast, and then the Confederate left flank was being hit. Men fell, the line wavered, and just like that, the fog of war lifted from everyone's eyes, and it became obvious what was about to happen. The men in Pickett's charge were now advancing into a death trap, a pincer of cannon and rifle fire from which there would be no escape. Now the only question was how many would make it back alive. The march across Pennsylvania's farmland that day must have seemed like one of those nightmares from where you can see the terrible thing about to happen, but are powerless to stop it. When the Union guns opened up, the death toll was staggering. Northern troops reported seeing ten men killed by a single shell. As one soldier from Ohio wrote, arms, heads, blankets, guns, and knapsacks were thrown and tossed into the clear air. As the guns let rip, those on the flanks started to push inwards, trying to make themselves invisible in the mass of men. But this only made the cannon fire even more effective. By the time the Confederates were just 500 yards from enemy lines, they'd lost formation. When they reached their target, they'd be forced to fight in individual pockets, not as a single powerful mass. Oh, I'm sorry, when I said when they reached their targets, that was the wrong word. The proper one was if they reached their target. Because many never would. When the charge hit Emmitsburg Road and the fences running alongside at a mere 100 yards from Hancock's men, the Union unleashed a salvo of lead right into them. Over 400 rifle shots peppered the Confederate line at once. So many were wounded in the volley that the Union positions reported hearing a loud groan rise in the air. Yet the defense was only just getting started. As artillery joined the rifle fire, General Trimble fell from his horse. Moments later, General Pettigrew's men surged forward just north of a jutting piece of stone 
wall known as the Angle. This uh, was meant to be the main attack point, the place where the Confederates would break through and slice Meade's lines in half. Instead, nearly everyone who surged forward at this point was mown down. One Mississippi regiment lost every single one of its members. It was now clear that the attack was a costly failure. That image of victory generally thought it seen had just been a cruel mirage. But rather than end only in a massacre, Pickett's charge would first hit one of the most fabled points in Civil War legend, the high water mark of the Confederacy. Just as all seemed lost, Brigadier General Lewis Armistead personally led around 250 men from Pettigrew and Pickett's divisions over the stone wall at the Angle and into history. With a cry of, come on boys, give them the cold steel, Armistead cut his way into the Union lines before himself being cut down by gunfire. Yet his men surged on. For a few breathless minutes, the Confederates were able to take ground at the angle, take it, and hold it. Not that they had time to celebrate. The breakthrough in the lines was marked by fierce hand-to-hand -hand combat, by an ugly brawl for command of this fragment of northern land. Seeing what was happening, Union Colonel Arthur Devere urgently asked General Hancock for permission to take his men into the angle and join the fight. Let me in there, he shouted, to which Hancock grimly replied, go in there pretty quick. Behind him ran other brigades, desperate to block the hole in their lines. Before they could get there, the Confederate cannons started up again, likely a wild attempt to give those taking the angle some cover. But with everything such a mess, the shells didn't have a hope of accuracy. Whether they were in Union blue or Confederate gray, those in the way died all the same. Among their number was nearly Winfield S. Hancock. Mounted on top of his horse, the Union general was hit by a piece of shrapnel that buried in his leg, leaving an ugly wound. But while those around him were all like, Mr. General dude, we need to get you back to a doctor, Hancock refused to leave. So long as the fight continued, he would remain in the field. Luckily, the fight wouldn't last much longer. Down at the angle, the few remaining Confederates managed to push the Union troops back long enough for a breather for a chance to look around for the reinforcements that they were sure were coming their way. What they saw instead was nothing. Nothing of their backup but bodies on a battlefield. They're taking the angle all right, but now they were alone with the full fury of Meade's reinforcements bearing down on them. In our other choice, they did what any of us would probably do. They ran. Ran for their lives, abandoning the angle. It was the turning of the tide, the retreat of the Confederate flood, leaving behind what would later become known as the South High Watermark. It would take nearly two more years, but eventually the turning tide was destined to sweep them all the way back to where they'd come from. After the loss of the angle, Pickett's charge was effectively over. What men survived hauled ass back across that mile of farmland. They ran for the safety of the Confederate lines like... Well, like men who'd just come within moments of death. And to be clear, there had been a lot of death. In the near hour that the fighting had raged, the Confederacy had suffered 6,555 men killed, missing, or wounded. That's a staggering number, equivalent to over half of all those who participated in Pickett's charge. And that's just the overall casualty rate. For the group that actually took the angle, the rate was closer to 70%. Major General Pickett himself lost so many soldiers that he literally cried as he reported to Robert Lee, his cheeks wet with tears. Of course, it wasn't only the Confederacy that suffered that day. Across the lines, the bombardment and attack had left 1,500 Union men killed or wounded, a big number, but one dwarfed by the Confederate casualties. As a shell-shocked rebel captain would later write to the charge, we gained nothing but glory and lost our bravest men. He wasn't exaggerating. Of all Confederate casualties in the entire three-day Battle of Gettysburg, nearly a quarter occurred in the single hour. In terms of noble, pointless, and bloody assaults, Pickett's charge ranks above even the infamous charge of the Light Brigade. Like the Light Brigade's failure, it would also be romanticized after the fact, turning it into a noble endeavor rather than what it was, a complete and utter cluster even Robert E. Lee could see this, standing and apologizing to his surviving men as they returned from the killing fields. While his later reports would be written to absolve him of blame, on that bloody afternoon, Lee personally went to the weeping Pickett and told him, General Pickett, this has been my fight, and upon my shoulders rests the blame. Pickett wasn't interested in forgiving the older man. For the rest of his life, and he lived until 1875, it said that in private, Pickett nursed a bitter grudge against the commander who'd forced him to waste so many good soldiers. Yet Lee wasn't the only leader who'd come out of the charge looking bad. Across the lines, General Meade should have been flush with victory. After all, it had been his judicious placing of troops that allowed for quick reinforcements when the anger was breached. But Meade 
wasn't feeling flush with anything. As the Battle of Gettysburg reached its end, he found himself presiding over an army of the Potomac that had just suffered more casualties than, to that point, any other army in U.S. history. While some wanted him to now launch his own assault on the wounded Confederates, he was too aware of his men's exhaustion, too aware of the risk that he might allow another picket's charge to happen, this time in reverse. So he held back, and Lee and his army were able to retreat south, bloodied but intact. For this sin, General Meade would be vilified by history. Today, with that perfect hindsight we talked about, Pickett's charge has come to be seen as a turning point, the moment when the rebels lost the Battle of Gettysburg, and thus the war. Now, this isn't the view among historians. For Civil War buffs, the fall of Vicksburg to Ulysses S. Grant's forces just a day later marks the real turning point of the conflict. Yet in the popular imagination, it's Gettysburg that made the difference. The moment when General Lee finally overreached and suffered his first serious defeat. All of which raises the question, why did the charge fail? Why did Lee's massive gamble go about as well as sinking your life savings into terror coin? Well, there are numerous theories, some of which we've already outlined. The failed bombardment, the basic competency of Meade putting reinforcements in place. There are others, too, that we refuse to touch, such as the old canard that North Carolinians in the charge got spooked and upset the formation. But in the end, perhaps we should leave the last word on this to George Pickett himself, despite what he may have privately thought about Lee's culpability. When asked in late life why he thought the charge had failed, he gave a simple answer. I've always thought, the old man mused, the Yankees had something to do with it. <laughs>